Morena, uh, thank you for the invitation to come and speak. Um, I, I'll give it a couple of uh, caveats in my presentation. That the, this is my view, and uh, you need to put it in perspective of your own environment. Uh, a farm, uh, uh, Wangarei Heads, as has been identified, Kaikuya dominant uh, farm. Uh, we're currently uh, in a climate that's uh, challenging, and we currently uh, are not replanting in any perennial ryegrass or endophyte species and focused on fescues and cotsplits for all our permanent pastures. Yes, sir. Um, so my, my basis is based on 40 years of observing the cyclical nature of our farming ecosystem and before that looking at uh, previous, previous history. Uh, we have regular dry summers, warm wet winters and varying soil types which add to the challenging uh, environment and those dry summers are, are not a new thing. They, um, they've been around for a long time, but what we're observing now is that those, the weather conditions we're getting are becoming more extreme. Our, our, our wets are becoming more big dumps of higher uh, millimetres of rainfall and our dries are becoming longer and, and drier. And uh, for the last 50 years, perennial ryegrass pastures have, have struggled to persist. Um, We've seen lacklustre results from modern ryegrass cultivars, including uh, associated endophytes, uh, and we've been persisting uh, with ryegrass species that are still ryegrass plants. They have a root system and a mass that, that are, uh, are not fit for purpose in terms of challenging environmental conditions. And despite potential benefits of uh, uh, the endophyte uh, agronomic, agronomic advantages, uh, we are not seeing the uh, persistence um, as, as we would like to see. Um, but because of that lack of assistance, that's allowed us to benefit from our natural resilient pastures in terms of our natural kaikuyu, and also the other species like fescues and cotsfits we are, which we're uh, following down on. Uh, and, and this is why. Th this is a typical Northland uh, emerging from summer situation very little ryegrass species and, and reversion of kaikuyu. Uh, Northland and some Waikato regions are not always conducive for, for ryegrass to persist and that's becoming uh, more so and, and mainly because of what I described as the root, root structures in the plant itself. Uh, we've developed management tools uh, around um, our management practices varying herb, plant and crop varieties which, which uh, we've been putting into our systems to make ourselves more resilient, uh, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't help the resistance aspect. Uh, modern, modern fescues and cocks, which, which, I, which I'll, I'll sort of um, stay with because that's what we're, um, we're planting and experiencing, have root structures and mass that are more beneficial to those climatic and seasonality changes. Uh, in the 80s, uh, we were planting, and a lot of other farmers were planting, what we call triple mixes, which were cocksfoot, fescue, and white clover. Uh, they were difficult to manage because of those varieties, and farmers um, have gone away from them. The issues we have today is that farmers uh, are, are reluctant to go back to what they previously knew. Uh, and those farmers that have tried the old varieties must try again. Farm management practices must adapt and farmers must un unlearn the techniques and systems that they've been taught. Uh, these uh, varying species need different management techniques and so farmers need to adapt to that. Uh, the modern cocksfoots and fescues uh, will exceed dry matter and energy production in the same environment and recent measurements that we've just done has, has, has demonstrated that where ryegrass pastures are not performing through the summer, these ones are. Um, which leads on to increased palatability. The, these modern fescues and cocksfoots are extremely pal palatable and, and though that palatability uh, directs straight into the milk vat and to meat production, uh, which, 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 which we've seen um, on a daily basis. Um, however, that increased palatability leads to uh, pasture pressure and that's why we need to connect back to those management systems and unlearn some of the things that we've got ingrained in our, in our heads. And uh, I'll just throw a couple of photos in. This is a fescue coxfoot mix that was uh, drilled into a, um, a ryegrass pasture and you can see the, the, the difference. Uh, but also in terms of the difference, you, you, you would think an electric fence has been put around that, that strip. It hasn't. 
It's purely pelletability and grazing pressure from young stock. Uh, it's, a, it's a ryegrass pasture, the long pasture, uh, uh, cocksfoot, fescue, the, uh, the middle one. And, and that grazing pressure carries on. And the result uh, from that endophyte effect and pelletability effect uh, also carries on. Um, and so when you get uh, the ability to be able to grow uh, a, a feed right through the year and you get um, the climatic effects um, uh, 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 mitigated and you can feed animals, do not underestimate the positive effects on, on farmer well-being that this, um, this takes. Uh, we also observe there is increase in the ratio of clover population and fixation of N. Um, and this is mainly due to the slow establishment of these species. Uh, it allows the clovers to, to establish at the same rate and stays in the, in the, in the uh, sward. Uh, we see a, a, an increased reduction in soil degradation and we see cracking and exposure um, of soil only happening in the real extreme conditions. Uh, plants are competitive and, and, and the open space reduces uh, excluding unwanted species and also um, holds off the reversion of Daikuyu. Uh, this is an example of a typical, it was actually that same paddock I showed the photos of earlier, in the ryegrass, typical north and summer, ryegrass dying, big cracks. And uh, the same paddock with, um, with your coxfoot fescue and how they hold it together compared with its mate next door, which, is, um, which has got uh, degradation. Interestingly, I had a visit from a regenerative agri agricultural group who went away completely confused around what they saw, uh, that we were achieving what some of their objectives were in a conventional farming um, manner. So I think it's really important we, um, we tie the two together. The, indi the industry's been going down a route of perennial ryegrass resistance for 40 years, and I would suggest we've been going down a, a rabbit hole where we've been chasing resistance um, re 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 um, instead of resilience. And resilience pa resilient pastures in our toolbox have a truly productive economic and environmental uh, benefit to us. The next 30 years should focus on farm systems that are profitable, sustainable, and resilient. And, uh, and that includes having a decent look at our subtropicals that we currently have in, in, a, in a native form. In summary, perennial dried grass is not fit for purpose in a lot of northern North Island. The next 30 years should focus on farm systems that are profitable, sustainable, and resilient, and, and look at R&D into those. Uh, resilient pastures in our toolbox have a truly productive environmental and economic value, and our modern coxfords and fescue pastures will exceed energy dry matter production in the same environment. Uh, management practices within our, within our farm, uh, farm people need to change, and we need to unlearn our current practices. Uh, we're seeing an improved end fixation and less soil degradation, and fescue and coxfoot pastures are truly resilient and regenerative. Uh, and also, finally, do not underestimate the, the farmer well-being with the use of resilient pastures around the ability to grow pasture and feed animals. Thank you very much. Eight minutes.